Okay, we are recording. All right, thank you. Good evening, everybody. It is September 10. This is a regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council. And um, I am going to see if everyone is here by saying here or present and let us know you can hear us. I'll start with Pat DeAngelis. Present. Um, Councillor Ette. Present. Councillor Haneke. Present. And Pam Rooney is present. We're still waiting for one other councillor, but we have a quorum. So pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by chapter 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by chapter two of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of meeting members of the public is possible, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. I'm going to just see if Jennifer can hear us. I can, I'm sorry. Great, great. So we're all here. Um, we've done call to order, so there are no public hearings tonight. We um, do want to open up for general public comment. I probably will ask if there are public comments um, between any of the sections that we talk about during the action items. And uh, we'll look for hands in the audience. Uh, I see one at least starting now. So I will open up general public comment to uh, matters within the jurisdiction of the CRC. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. And uh, we do not typically engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised by public comment, but that doesn't mean we don't or can't. So let's bring Martha Hanner in, please. <laughs> Thank you. This is Martha Hanner. I live in District 5 and I'm speaking as an individual. It's been nine months since CRC received the solar bylaw for review with its report due on June 30th. This is now September. And I am quite concerned about your review process. What is the role of CRC in reviewing a document, a bylaw, which requires expertise, which none of you have. You know, you bust around with wordsmithing and cutting and pasting and so on without really understanding why certain things were included in the bylaw. And I think the result has been rather a large waste of your time and town staff time and resources. Um, you know, when it's a subject that you don't really have expertise, you could either have relied on the experts to understand why certain sections were in the document, or you could have um, become knowledgeable by reading some of the materials that were in your resource, resource file. For example, you know, have you all read the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission's model solar bylaw? Because that was really the basis that we started from in drafting our bylaw. And so if you want to understand what's in there, you know, that's where to start. And so, uh, you know, granted that the original version did have a few long-winded sentences and so on, but you really have to understand what the meaning is first. And so, from my viewpoint, I should think you should have started from a larger uh, picture and asked, first, is the bylaw a complete standalone document so that a solar developer can readily find what they need to know for their application? Two, does the bylaw follow construction best practices to preserve soil, protect water supplies, manage stormwater, and prevent erosion? Three, does the bylaw support the science and the Massachusetts climate and land use goals? And four, does the bylaw reflect the community values of the residents who elected you as their representatives? Our tax dollars paid last year for a survey of residents' values and I've heard no reference to that in any of your discussions. And, and so I think it's really time to reassess your role uh, and make a plan tonight for completing your review, committing to a deadline, and passing it on to the next stage. So thank you. Thank you, Mark Martha. 
Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak? We'll, we'll come back to some of the topics. So this isn't the last opportunity. Okay. <clears throat> so we have on the action items, we have solar bylaw with staff review and comments, the battery storage and feedback from town staff on strategy and also the nuisance bylaw if necessary. And I think we may in fact touch on all three of those tonight. I'm going to ask if the staff is willing to reverse the order of the first and second items and, and really um, get into a good discussion about the battery storage um, bylaw. And for folks listening in the audience, the um, Christine Brestrup, Director of Planning, um, did draft a standalone battery energy storage system bylaw as a proposal. Um, it has not been referred to CRC yet. It has not been to, referred to anybody yet. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that we all understood where town staff is thinking um, about the role and or um, opportunity for such a standalone bylaw. So I want to turn it over to uh, Christine and Stephanie and Dave, if he has comments on that topic. Pat, you've got your hand up. I can't. I don't you. understand. I don't understand why we're not getting into the solar bylaw because uh, now. Because but that's, that's your decision. Thank you. The battery storage is a fairly concise topic, and I'm hoping to check it off. Well, the conversation about it may be, and I'm hoping to check that off and then get into the solar. So thank you. Uh, Christine and Stephanie. Um, so I believe that we should have a separate battery energy storage system bylaw. I think it's complicated enough that it needs a standalone section. Um, and I, so we have prepared a draft. Um, I haven't really examined this very carefully since last November, and I know there are things that I would change. This was not reviewed by the working group because they didn't have time to review it. So I think it merits um, a good going over. There may be parts of it that don't even need to be in here, um, such as sections where battery storage is in buildings. Um, I need to talk to the building commissioner about that, but certainly if it's related to a residential use or a small commercial use, it doesn't really need to be in the bylaw. Um, so I think what we should do is focus on the larger battery storage systems, um, both the ones that are um, included in a solar array, because now the state requires that battery storage be included in all solar array um, projects. And... Um, and there are, you know, there are two different scales of, of large scale battery storage. So I think this merits um, work. And um, if, if, uh, if the board, if the group here, CRC agrees with that, um, there may be an opportunity for me to work with you on this, um, but that's to be determined. Any thoughts from any um, Councilor Haneke? So I have some questions. Well, let me just start with, personally, I think a BESS bylaw is more important than a large scale solar, large ground, whatever, LGPI um, bylaw. But my personal opinion, isn't really what matters here. I look at what our process is as a council. Best bylaws have not been referred to CRC. Solar has. We've, as a council, been talking about a whole lot of town manager goals and council goals and how does the workflow fit in and how do we give guidance as a council to various, um, to the manager on what he should be giving guidance to on his staff. And best systems haven't even come up in those discussions. Solar bylaw has versus for planning department versus housing and zoning, other zoning bylaws have all been part of that discussion, but a best bylaw has not. And so I'm curious, you know, I while personally 
I would rather spend time on a best bylaw than a solar bylaw. I'm not sure it's within CRC's jurisdiction to give that guidance to the planning department. I think that's within CRC's jurisdiction to say, hey, we, to the council, make a recommendation to the council that says you've referred solar to us. We now think that a best bylaw would be more important to work on. Council, what do you believe? And if it's not CRC that's drafting the bylaw, right? With the solar, it was referred to us to review and recommend. It sounds like from what Ms. Brestrup just said that that she would look to us, but she would be drafting it. The way we've done that in the past is the council has tasked the manager with, you know, that we've directed the manager to bring to the council a bylaw um, or an X, Y, Z. We did that with various other things. And so I, I just wanted to bring that up of, I don't think it's within CRC's jurisdiction to be saying, hey, planning department, go forward with working on a best bylaw that it would be within CRC's jurisdiction to vote to recommend to the council something and that the council would need to make that decision mm -hmm. of where does it think the town manager should be uh, directing, potentially directing town staff's time in the planning department that is in another, what is it, two weeks, <laughs> going to be down to two members um, with a whole lot going on, including comprehensive permits that are just heating up and this and that um, versus other potential items that the council cares about that the planning department could be working on. Where is that ranking? And the council needs to make a decision um, or the council could say, CRC, you work on it, but you don't take up staff time similar to, you know, in terms of you know, I, I say similar to rental registration, staff time was taken up by attending our meetings, but staff did not do the redrafting or the editing or any of that. That was myself and Pam Rooney as chair and vice chair that kept bringing different documents and different drafts back. So I think that's the conversation we need to have. I don't think it would be appropriate to just start redrafting a best bylaw right now, even though I actually think it's more important than a solar, an LGPI by bylaw. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. So if I is right now, the best is section 18 of the solar bylaw. So isn't it part of the solar bylaw? I mean, we may make a recommendation that it be a separate document, but right now it's, that's how it appears in our package. Section 18.0. I can answer, Chris, Chris, you want to answer that? Yeah, um, when we draft a bylaw, we assign it a number that we think it would be, it would have in the actual zoning bylaw. So the next number that we had was 17 for the large scale solar array and 18 for the battery energy storage. That doesn't mean it's going to have that number when it actually gets to town council for a vote. It was just kind of a placeholder that we put on it. And it's not part of the solar bylaw, it's a standalone. Uh, Stand uh, standalone. Stand okay, I didn't. I didn't understand that. Um, I mean, I knew that we might want it to be that, but I thought it had actually started out as part of. But the solar bylaw working group worked on what you gave us. Was that just from you? It was never worked on by the solar bylaw working group. Is that yeah. correct? May I answer that? Sure. So yeah. it was never worked on by the solar bylaw working group. It was thought about, and we had a discussion about whether it should be part of the solar bylaw or not. And there are aspects of um, BESS in the solar bylaw as it has been drafted, but it's a very short section, and we thought it needed to be more robust than that. So, um, but I would like to remind you all that. We have already approved a battery energy storage um, facility on Sunderland Road. The Zoning Board of Appeals did a very good job of reviewing that. Um, I think it was in the summer of 2023. And we've already had, I believe it's five large scale ground mounted uh, solar photovoltaic installations that were approved in town. So I feel like the Zoning Board of Appeals is doing a pretty good job with staff support the way things are. Um, it would be 
helpful for them to have a solar bylaw and a battery energy storage bylaw, but I don't think it's a, I don't, I don't myself think of it as a matter of urgency. Pat, any comments? Jennifer. So, but did we, okay, I, I guess I'm fuzzy on this. Did, how did this come to get to us then? I mean, did staff yeah, think it was yeah, a good yeah. idea? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, when a solar installation was proposed a number of years ago, um, concerned citizens and a couple of council members came forward with the idea for a moratorium on um, solar installations. And at that time, we said no to the moratorium and we said yes to working on a solar bylaw. So the solar bylaw working group was established and it worked for quite a while to come up with the solar bylaw. And then that was presented to town council with the, um, with the recommendation that it be refined by the CRC. So that's how it got to you. No, 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 I was asking, I do know, I know that's how we got the solar bylaw because I think we were, we were on the count, I was on the council then, but no, how did the battery storage, I guess, cause we're, the comment was made that we're um, out of our process, but the battery storage did get did not do. Did I, I can ask that. for it, or did I can answer that? Okay. Go ahead, um, go ahead, Andy. Section seventeen oh nine. Well, it's now seventeen oh nine. I don't know what it was in the original solar bylaw working group draft. Solar bylaw has, a, as as Jennifer you mentioned, has a section on battery energy storage systems that's very minimal. The very first part of that section has a sentence that says the town of Amherst is working on a bylaw to regulate BESS systems, best systems. And so when that draft working solar group bylaw was at the council for discussion for potential referral to CRC to work on, I asked at, in that discussion, I asked Chris, well, this refers to working on a bylaw to regulate best, do you have that? And Chris was kind enough to provide the council with her current draft of that because, so I asked for it as a counselor because it was mentioned within a document that was referred to CRC and, and the council considered potentially referring that bylaw to CRC during that discussion once it was produced and the council decided not to because it was in it was in very basic form that had not been reviewed or worked on extensively. And I, I believe at the time, Christine, you said you weren't really prepared to have it referred for review and recommendation at that time, but you were providing it because me as a counselor during that discussion said, hey, this document here that we're referring says you're working on one. Do you have a draft of that? <laughs> so that's, that's how we have a public draft. Thank you, Pat. Uh, I don't need to speak okay. right now. Chris, you want to add something else? Oh, I just wanted to mention that um, Councillor Rooney asked me to send her the battery energy storage draft bylaw, which is how it got into your packet today. Well, several previous ones as well, but yes, mm -hmm. certainly in this one, right? And because we wanted to talk about it specifically tonight, in just uh, take the temperature of the group to figure out um, uh, the approach to take on it. I have two, I see two hands in the audience and I suspect that these are people who had that conversation. Um, I see Janet McGowan and Martha Hanner. I'm going to let them come in because they probably have some responses to- uh, Point of order. Uh, sure. Are you opening up general public comment again at this time so that anyone in the audience can raise their hand and speak and comply with our general public comment guidelines. Yes. If you're doing that and you intend to, can I ask if this is an intent to do this, I've seen you do this on many meetings at various times without necessarily a indication of when during the meeting it will happen or when during a discussion it will happen, just sometime during discussion. Can you for our committee purposes and me as a member purpose, set out your guidelines on to when and how you do this and what the rules behind that are. And if it's going to be done and you know when you set an agenda, you're gonna do this after or during every single discussion item or action item, 
put it on the agenda so people know that it's going to be yeah. there. I feel like we're not operating with transparency for members of the public on public comment or potentially within our council rules. So I'd like some more stuff. Um, maybe sure. we need it I on can, an agenda I can put item it on, I, I as a future agenda item about public comment during CRC meetings. Great. I'd be happy to do that. I think I think there's more transparency. The more conversation we have, the the greater the transparency. But that's just my opinion. But Jennifer, if the public doesn't know it's going to happen because it's not on the agenda, it is not transparent to the public unless they're attending the meeting, and so then it's less transparent. That's why I would like to have a future agenda item about public comment and how we handle it in this meeting. Great. Well, I will put that on a future agenda item. Thank you. Jennifer. Pam, could I is it, read out? Is, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I just feel like we're getting tied up in our own process. We're talking about what happened on the Solar Bylaw Working Group. We have two people in the audience that were on it. Isn't there, and I brought this up months ago, is there not a way to, so we probably could have moved along faster. Is there not a way to have some of that expertise in the room. I mean, just people that can answer questions in the room. It would just, there, there's there got to be a way we we can get it, the information we, we need. Because we I don't think- The committee could have a discussion and a potential vote to be inviting the entire silo, solar bylaw working group to meetings, not just the people who choose to attend. It, because right now it's not everyone. Mandy, you didn't raise your hand. And I appreciate what you said. Uh, basically, we had a public comment period. It's over. So I don't know if Janet McGowan can speak right now unless, um, it, is she going to speak to what's already been proposed as the original topic? But the other thing that's bothering me, which is, and I would love Janet to speak to that. I don't... But the other thing that's bothering me is we have Stephanie Ciccarella, who worked with the Solar Bylaw Working Group very diligently. We have a lot, and, and there are disagreements between the members of the um, Solar Bylaw Working Group, not in the sense of everybody knows we need a solar bylaw, but there were differences about what the uh, focus should be, what could be allowed. So I'm not interested in in getting more people in here necessarily when I have Stephanie, when I have Christine. But I do feel very strongly that we're we're no, I'm not going to say that. But I am concerned about how the meeting is getting structured. And I appreciated what you said, Mandy. Even though you forgot you. to raise your so hand, so we'll have kid. we'll have a we'll have a future <laughs> discussion topic on on public comment. I think I said at the very beginning we're going to have open public comment, and I may open it up to public comment again after the different topics, so that people could weigh in on each of the topics that we are discussing. To me, that makes a lot of sense. It's fresh in our minds. We'll we'll discuss it more fully another time. Councilor Haneke. Um. So so that brings up another question. Are is the Counts, is CRC done discussing the best and you're opening up to general public comment and then we're moving on to a different action item or will we come back to discussing? Because you just said after the topic is discussed, not in the middle. So I, this is why I'm trying to figure out the rules around general public comment because I don't think we were done yet you seem to say, oh, they raised their hand, we're gonna open this up. We haven't had our full discussion yet. Are we coming back to our discussion after you open up general public comment. Yes. And then if they yes. decide they raised their hand again, are you is it going to be multiple? Gen I'm trying to get the rules. Jeez. Oh, good. You like rules. I don't necessarily. So if we can clarify rules for your benefit, great. Let's let's uh for tonight. Um, I am going to let these two people speak. They have their hands up, and maybe that's and 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 then we will continue as a as a committee to discuss best. I would like to sort of wrap up the topic of best before we before we go on to solar bylaw tonight. Pat, you're muted. 
we already heard from Chris, and there is no reason to be working on best this evening. And we need to get to, down to the work of the solar bylaw um, as much. And I think battery storage is critically important. Um, I agree. Uh, but we do not, we have not been charged with it. And I don't like playing by the rules either, but it's clear in this meeting and other meetings how the rules do help us move along. And okay. so I, you know. As, as chair, I would like to, I would like to personally have some conclusion on what the CRC recommendation is for handling BESS. Do we want to send a recommendation to town council to have it referred to us for future work. We all know that this is the same document that Chris Brestrup said was not necessarily ready last fall. It's the same document now, so it hasn't progressed. Um, I'm looking for some suggestions from CRC on recommendations to town council and our next step on that. That's what I would like to figure out tonight. Pat, you want to make a recommendation on how to handle it with with and send it to, to town council for discussion? Anybody have any suggestions on how to handle this? And, and we it all agree like, that it's important. It seemed like Chris was saying that she is going to be working on it. Um, while she's here before we lose her which is going to be major loss um and that we can bring we can i don't think it's ready for crc so um i don't know i don't know i, <laughs> I really think chris should be working on it because she proposed that when chris brings it brings it to, to the council or dave save me <laughs> Dave has his hand up, and then Jennifer. Um, let's see. So given given Chris's limited time with us, I think we need to, I think I said this a meeting or two ago, we, we need to be thinking about Stephanie's role as this moves forward. And clearly, she will be working very, very closely with you on both the solar bylaw and the, the BESS uh, bylaw, however that plays out. Um, I'm not going to weigh in on whether BESS should be discussed tonight or not, but I think realistically with Chris just, you know, two weeks away from, from retiring, I don't think she's going to have a lot of time to work on this. Um, uh, we, we are joking in the hallway today. Chris goes, well, I'm going to be working on that and working on that. So <laughs> again, it, it's going to be Stephanie really taking the lead. Um, and, and I, I do think, um, you know, we would be happy to work with CRC to to move this back to the council and get a recommendation. I do just want to reference something Mandy said earlier, which is, you know, it's going to be October 1st. Before you know it, we're going to be two planners down. Um, we know that we have the solar bylaw before you and we're working that and we want to continue to work that with you. And then I also know that... Um, the uh, overlay for University Drive, uh, which we've been talking about for a number of weeks in council meetings, um, um, you know, there is a memo, there is a recommendation coming from the planning board, and I believe it has reached the manager's office. So when Paul gets back, we want to move that along. So between working on the solar bylaw, working with the whole council on the overlay, that's in addition to all the other work that the planning department is going to have on their plate. Um, so BESS may need to, it, it's coming, but it may need to be a little bit in the future, I think is what I'm saying. Um, we, we'll do the best we can. But um, so I think for the fall, having the solar bylaw and um, the overlay district is going to be a lot because the uh, overlay district will then get referred to CRC, right? So yeah. anyway, and we, you know, that's a that's a really important zoning, um, you know, uh, uh, topic to be discussed with the full commission, uh, the full council. 
Thank you for that perspective. That helps. Um, I'm going to suggest, given that, that we are going to set aside the best for the time being, and we will pick it up when we think there is uh, an opportunity to carve out some time and work on it. Uh, we have the we have the current draft. We have lots of interest in it, and I think it's something that somebody may, um, in fact, offer to pick up and and work on. Jennifer. Okay. Last word. I just my observation. I have been in committee meetings and I have been in the audience at like planning board meetings where the chair will call on someone in the audience. If there's a discussion happening and the chair sees, because they can see the names of the people that someone has their hand up that they think could, isn't offering public comment, isn't an opinion, but might have some pertinent information that will help the committee's discussion. So that's what I thought you were doing, that you were not opening up, but you thought someone might have some pertinent information. And I see chairs do that, you know, not infrequently. Me too. So is there any disagreement with that approach, Mandy? Yeah, I planning board, ZBA, they don't operate under the same rules the council does. The council has adopt, adopted its own rules of procedure that we as a council committee are subject to. Um, and I, I'm not sure this committee is following those rules of procedure. Um, and that's why I would like a discussion on an agenda because we have council rules that apply to council committees regarding public comment and participation in council meetings as invited participants, pre-invited participants and the rules people must follow. And I'm not sure we've been following them. And so I'd like an agenda item about following the rules that council has adopted for council meetings and committee meetings and clarity about them. Great, and we said we would put it on a future agenda item. So we're in agreement. Any other thoughts on wrapping up best, the best conversation for the time being? I'm going to go to two people in the audience. I'm gonna reopen the public comment period for this topic, which is best. If you have something to say about best, raise your hand. If you do not, you can keep your hand down and we'll finish up that conversation. I'm gonna call on Janet McGowan for three minutes. Um, hi, thank you for um, listening to me or having me in your meeting. Um, this is not what I planned to say, but at the planning board, we have general public comment in the beginning of the meeting on topics, not on the agenda. We, uh, when we get to an agenda topic, we have a discussion and then we stop and ask people in the audience if they have more comments or information, and then we go back and discuss some more. And this is a great process because people feel involved, people have information. And as a pub person commenting, you're listening to the discussion and you might have something to add or just to offer your view. Offering a comment after a decision has been made, not so involved, not so helpful. You don't feel like you're really part of it. So I just would recommend that as a procedure. Um, it works well. It doesn't really um, tie down the meeting. So, but I, what, I, what I wanted to say was um, doing best was part of the solar bylaw working groups um, charge. And we did put some best in and Chris towards the very end brought in this other best, which was based on some work done um, on the where best. And we didn't absolutely didn't have time to look at it. I would, you know, and the, and I think that, you know, going back into the history is the ZBA is looking for help from, they want a bylaw, they want a solar bylaw, they want a best bylaw. They are maybe developing some expertise in this area, but they're, I mean, the level of information and depth that we went to and learned is nothing that the ZBA had and also ZBA members change, right? And so you don't want to, you know, people move on and off all the time. And the purpose of these bylaws, and it could be the solar bylaw could have a very substantial best section, is to guide solar developers and the town and, you know, and how to make the decisions about it and good decisions. 
there are probably 80 or 100 towns that have these bylaws. And so we don't have to like recreate the wheel, but we have to move our wheel to get this done. And if you go back to the town council and say, should we do a best? And the town council has already said, do best in the solo bylaw. I don't know where we're going or why, but I know we're not helping the ZBA. And I think it can be done. So I really, you know, this was a very arduous process on the solar bylaw working group. I wouldn't recommend the process that we did, but we did a process. We came up with something. I think we should just, the, your committee should just move forward. And, you know, maybe somebody can peel off and look at five different best, you know, things and Chris's work on it and bring it back to the group. But we have to move forward as a town. We can't spend four or five years asking what the process and it's very circular. We're not helping the ZBA. We're not helping anything. You know, battery storage is a hot issue. It, we need to resolve it and it's resolvable. So I really urge you not to go into like a process thing because the process is already taking place. Um, so that, that's really just, I'm getting a little more emphatic than I was planning on, but you know, it's all doable. Um, you know, the planning department is very short. So maybe somebody on the committee or somebody in the community can work on it with somebody and come back. But I do really think, you know, don't go back to the town council and ask them if we should do what the town council already told the silo, solar bylaw working group to do. It doesn't make sense to me. Thank you. Uh, Martha Hanner. I appreciate the chair. If you would be timing the public comment, please. Yep. Thank you, Martha Hanner. All right. Thank you. Uh, yes, I will have to say that based on what I said before, it would be absolutely crazy to say that CRC has the competence to review a, a, a battery storage bylaw. You don't know anything about the subject. Uh, there, the person in town who knows about this subject very thoroughly is P Chris Bascom. He came and spoke to our solar bylaw working group. He is the resident expert. It's his responsibility to know all the state and federal laws. The NFPA section 855 uh, is one of the more important things to do. And I can say for the solar bylaw, I have gone through, I've read NFPA 855, I've read the battery storage bylaw. And so I have written to Chris, Restra multiple times, in fact, as she poor Chris knows, about uh, what ought to be included. But I think our solar bylaw has to include uh, the sections from the from the best storage. But you folks, I think, have got to figure out a different process for the best storage review. And I would strongly recommend that it be the fire department uh, that uh, does the main reviewing for that. And maybe they could then come and make a presentation to you folks would be my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, back to agenda item, action item 4A, which is solar bylaw. And for this meeting, um, we have the, the changes and the modifications that CRC directed uh, the staff pleased to work on uh, to, to make those corrections. And I wonder if Stephanie and or Christine could walk us through their document, which is the 9424 version four, and essentially inform us what you have done and 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 in, introduce us to the document that went out to the other departments for staff input. I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie and Christine. Thank you, Pam. I'm happy to share my screen. And Chris, if you would like to, um, as I scroll, maybe make comment and I can jump in if needed. Sure, that's fine. Okay. So you're sharing the 9.424 version four? Correct. Yep. And I wanna be clear that this version Staff did not, other than some additions, staff did not make any changes or delete right. anything without guidance from this committee. I just want to be clear about that because there are sections that, you know, there's information that was deleted, but it was only deleted because we were told and guided to do so as part of this review. So anything that is in yellow was either moved 
or Chris Brestrup had been requested or asked to elaborate or create language. And so anything that Chris added or that was moved is highlighted in yellow. I just wanna say that up front as we, as we do this. So just give me a moment. Thank you. Are you seeing my screen? Yep. Yes. Okay. And is it large enough? Would you like me to make it large? <laughs> yes. Make it as large as you possibly can. Please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that good. One more. One more notch. Okay. That's much better. Okay. Um. So, um we kept a lot of the comments that we didn't um, take action on, and that's what you're seeing over in the right-hand side. And there are probably also comments that Stephanie and I put in here when we were um, going through it and revising it. So um, I'm just going to talk about that. So the first comment has to do with um, that sentence about that this article shall take precedence, precedence over less restrictive sections. So we have contemplated moving this to the end. Um, maybe we will do that at some point, but we didn't for this go around. Um, not sure what the next sentence means. It looks like it comes from Pam Rooney. Maintain for now, but consider a different placement, more editing. Don't know what that means. So more editing, Chris, was your additional comment that perhaps this needs more editing. Oh, the that that sentence comment with Pam's correct, and then the more editing was your addition. Okay. Um, the next has to do with the nexus statements, and we uh, consider um, deleting this section, but we didn't want to do that without um, coming back to the CRC. It seems that it's not as uh, important now because we're not limiting um, solar, by, solar installations on farmland and forests as much as we thought we might. And so we had these st strong statements in there to kind of inoculate us against um, appeals. But since we're not making those limitations, these sections might be taken out, but we didn't take them out yet. I noticed that Councillor Ette also said that he felt that those could be taken out. Um, so we left those in. Okay, keep going. Um, there was a def there were a couple of definitions that we uh, moved or eliminated. Um, we took out the reference to ecosystem services. We felt that it was um, it's down it was down below battery energy storage system, so that doesn't show up here as a yellow thing because it's not here. Um, but right above forests is was ecosystem services, and we took that out. We felt it was confusing. It was too all encompassing, and nobody would understand really what it meant. And um, so there may be another way of dealing with that topic, but we we just took that out. And that was something I believe we discussed with CRC. Um, we made a change in the forest section so that, uh, you know, to, to clarify that it was five meters, not five centimeters, that um, <clears throat> the trees were. Um, heavy rain event, we're leaving that in for now, even though there are questions about that, but we did receive input from the wetlands administrator that that is a common um, definition of a heavy rain event. Um, moving down to prime farmland, we shortened that definition quite a bit. We took out most of the words and just referred to the map that the um, Natural Resources Conservation Service has on the web that shows um, areas of prime far farmland throughout the United States. And that is the same that we did with soils. <clears throat> soils and farmlands of statewide importance Again, the USDA has a, a map that's available online that shows those um, soils, and so we didn't feel and that can, necessary to Christine, have. Can, excuse words. me, can we can we pause there? I've got three hands up. Um, Councilor Haneke, why don't you ask your questions? So yeah, um, 
I had reviewed some of this and came up with potential changes to it, um, questions about some stuff. And so I'm trying to figure out what our process is. Are we just going through what they said and then asking questions later as we hit each section? Should I be making recommendations for changes I'd like to see or questions I have about certain definitions or the inclusion of certain definitions? What what When's the right time to start saying, you know, I want to change here or here? I think that's the next meeting. What what we were trying to get through here is is the corrections or the at least the modifications that staff took took away from the CRC to go do as as requested, and just as Pat has done with her version of now suggestions, I'm thinking that if you want to outline your comments section by section and and provide comments just like the staff will, will be receiving from staff next round. Um, I think that would be an excellent way to, to start compiling all of the comments on these different sections. So we're not commenting today on any section. I'm trying, like. trying not to. because we don't have the staff comments. I would really like to have, I asked for staff comments back in January or February when we first got this referred to us. And it has taken us this long to get staff comments and I really want to see them. Um, uh, Councilor Ette. I think, uh... Pat's had her hand up before me. No, you oh, had your no, hand no. up. And I, I took it down, uh, okay. Councillor Ate. It's your turn. Yes, this is a question related to prime farmland and soil and farmlands mm -hmm. since that would highlight it in yellow. I was wondering what happens if these links don't work since we are speaking about definitions. What happens if what doesn't work? The links don't work the links. oh i don't think we oh the links yes i see yeah. um i think people could type those um those words those letters Copy. symbols into um a, a search engine and get to where we're aiming to get so the link doesn't necessarily have to work as long as the um in, in individual letters are accurate um but what I was referring to is it might not even appear at all. I think you've partially answered it because it's not so much about the link as the US Department web soil survey, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Huh? Yeah, I, I get my hand down. Uh, I just wanna be sure we're listening to staff's suggestions. These are not, uh, these have not been approved and we are not saying, yes, these, this is what the bylaw is going to be. Is that correct? Right. This is, that's correct. We're just we, seeing we what they're suggesting. not settled on anything yet. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Your version might suggest putting all of that back in. Nope, it doesn't. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and I do want to say, Councillor Ette, uh, one of the things that we talked about the last time, if I remember correctly, was removing some of the uh, links and just having the name. So that's something we can decide later. But I hear Which what you're your saying. draft does. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Um, can I just, I would like to make a really quick comment, though. Sure. Um, Again, I I just wanted to say that these were this was the you know the draft that we're looking at is the guidance that we got. So this is the draft that we got to so far. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I I don't want to characterize it as specifically staff suggestions because that feels kind of like this is only what Chris and I think. I think part of it this is that we were taking guidance from the committee and this is what we heard so far. So this is the draft. I just want to be clear on that point. So. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. Want to keep going? 
Yep, yeah, um, number 24 um, is highlighted, and that's also a reference to the um, map that is um, the natural uh, the web soil survey. So, um, and I don't know, let's see, 25, we didn't make, didn't make changes to 25. Chris, I think we're on um, section 1704, submittal requirements. Yes. Um, so that's what I'm looking at. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. So, well, there was just something highlighted at, at first. So. Oh. Um, someone wanted an additional statement with regard to the rules and regulations. I don't understand what that was. I don't know. Um, I think Stephanie and I discussed that. And as you can see in this note, no other rules and regulations would apply. So we could leave this reference here. If someone is aware of other rules and regulations that they feel need to be referred to here, maybe we could incorporate that. Councilor Haneke. No, I think it was from discussions where things were all over the place. Maybe I had said we need to refer to them if they're also going to apply but we might have been talking about a different section or something. I don't know. Um, it might just be a legacy from moving stuff all around. I actually had a question about the intent and purpose. Um, and one of the sentences that was highlighted up there, the provision set forth in this article shall take precedence over all other less restrictive sections of the zoning bylaw and the regulation of LGPIs. Um, I guess one of my questions is, I'm not sure we had decided, and I don't know whether we'll get staff comments on this, as to whether this is going to operate as a completely standalone bylaw with the de definitions in here and the fencing and anything else that might be considered or included in other sections of the bylaw. I know there's a fencing section, so that's why I keep mentioning fencing, but there's other sections of the bylaw that deal with some issues here, dimensional standards and X, Y, and Z. And I read that sentence and I, think well if it's it if it's more restrictive on in another section then it would apply but how do you know whether it's more restrictive and if this is supposed to be standalone should that sentence read more of this article shall take precedence over all other sections of the bylaw that may be in conflict or something like that like like i i, I guess i have a question about what the operability of that sentence is and what our intention of an Article 17 large scale ground mounted photovoltaic installation is in terms of complete standalone or not complete standalone as some other articles are where they work in 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 you know concert with all the articles of the bylaw. Um so I I don't know how to read this whole bylaw when I'm not sure we've made that decision yet and has staff talked about that decision as to complete standalone or not? Chris? So we've approached this in a couple of different ways throughout the bylaw. In the flood mapping uh, overlay section, it was a complete standalone. It contained all its own definitions and everything was right there in that section of the bylaw. In other sections like uh, having to do with marijuana, we have, you know, things in Article 3, we have things in Article 12, and so it's not, well, actually it doesn't even have an article devoted to it completely, but most of the bylaw has all of the definitions in the definition section, and it has, you know, other things in the section that they belong to. So we could do that here. We could take all of these definitions out and put them in the definition section. That decision was not made by the Solar Bylaw Working Group and it wasn't made by Stephanie and myself. Mandy, you're... you're... Yeah, a, a follow-up question. Um, and then a question on section 1701 applicability. Um, should that decision about whether it's completely standalone or not be made sooner rather than later? And does that decision affect how, depending on what that decision is, does that affect how any of these sections are written? So that's my question about full standalone or incorporated amongst various things. Um, and then, you know, if we pull definitions out, things like, well, do we know 
whether those terms are used in any other part of the bylaw that it might change if they are used, the effect of those parts. And, and that's something to think about later if we've pulled them out. So, and then on applicability, how does this section of applicability relate to the use table proposal that says, um, let me find it. Um, there's a use, use table proposal that came with this bylaw of 3.340.4 large scale ground mounted solar installations, LGPI, no other, no other description, no other thing that limits it to say article 17 or anything like that. And then is special permit across the board every single zone. Um, how does that special permit across the board, every single zone for any LGPI, not LGPI with Article 17 applicable, but LGPI, presumably the definition in LGPI stays, but this applicability section says potentially that there are certain LGPIs that, you know, parking lot canopies, um, particularly, I, I can't think of many more LGPIs that this applicability section says, that um, might Article 17 not apply to under 1701 the way it's stated, and 1701 seems to imply it would be an accessory use with a thing there, but the use table says special permit. So how do those interact with each other? Um, and with LGPI set forth directly in the draft use table that we got along with this bylaw, um, how do non-LGPI use, uses fit into determining, you know, in, in this, there's a definition for small scale ground mount, um, although that definition and that term is never used in the rest of the bylaw. Um, but if there's a small scale one or one that doesn't fit LGPI, how would you determine what the uh, permit requirement is on a use table and a zoning bylaw that tries to match the permit requirement to the most closely listed use in the use table? I hope that question's kind of clear. So I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how Article 17 interacts with the rest of the bylaw, including a use table that has a proposed LGPI blanket special permit, no exceptions. So Mandy, that's a really good thing to put in your in your comments um, so that we can hash through that. Christine. Um, I think in response to Mandy's question, I can at least say that some of these LGPIs are principal uses, in which case they would be um, determined by the use table as a principal use, and some of them are accessory uses, and accessory uses are determined by the um, regulatory regime for the principal use. So I'm going to use the example of Hampshire College. Hampshire College is a, an educational institution. Um, anything that goes on there is by site plan review um, because of, um, you know, certain limitations in Chapter 40A as far as um, regulating educational uses. So when they came along and they said that they wanted to have a solar array on their um, land as part of their educational use, it was considered to be an accessory. And therefore the building commissioner um, determined that um, it would be uh, under the jurisdiction of the planning board under site plan review, because that's um, how all of Hampshire College's um, property that is not and, and it wasn't in the ED zone, it was in some other zone. I can't remember what it was, probably L -R -R -L -D -R -R -O. Um in, in any case, it was an accessory use to Hampshire College on a non-ED property. So it was considered to um, be permitted by site plan review because it's part of this uh, educational institution. 
So I think um, that's how I would explain it. Things within the use table are um, determinative of principal uses and accessory uses when they're considered accessory to a principal use are uh, permitted based on how the principal use is permitted. Thank you. May I ask one more question? Yep. Sure. And, 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 and I recognize, Chair, that maybe I'm getting off center, but in order to review this when our comments are allowed, I kind of need to understand a little bit more about what this covers and not. And so my next question is small scale ground mount solar that doesn't have a use in a table, but might be a principal use. Um, should it be something that this bylaw covers? Like, how do we consider that as we're looking at solar bylaws and in, encouraging, you know, balancing the need for solar generation and renewable energy generation with the need to protect our health, safety, and welfare? Are we really looking at only regulating large-scale ground mount systems and and then how how... How should we be incorporating regulation, if we want to, of small-scale ground mount or non-regulation of small-scale ground mount? And is that something we should be considering as part of this bylaw and thinking about that as we propose potential changes or inclusion in Article 17? Chris, and then Pat. Um, so when we set out to do this, we were um, given the uh, request to deal with large-scale ground-mounted solar installations. Um, and I think the reason we have the definition in there for small-scale ground-mounted was just to show the difference between the two. We did not um, talk about how to regulate small-scale ground-mounted. I think they need to be, um, that needs to be figured out, but it wasn't part of the work of the Solar Bylaw Working Group, so we didn't address it in this, um, in this bylaw. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that it seems that it might be worth stating is that such small, small scale, such installations are permitted by right without a building permit or a site plan review. I mean, it feels like it's very important that if I want to add solar panels, um, a ground mounted solar panel in my yard or something like that, or um, a, a business wants to add it over the their parking um, canopies, that should be by right. Chris. So um, the way it's ahead, currently um, dealt with is that if someone wants to put a solar array on, on the roof um, of a building, then the uh, solar array that's on the roof doesn't need to go through any kind of land use permitting. Um, if someone wants to put a solar array in a parking lot, then that's considered an accessory use to whatever the principal use is. So for instance, um, I believe that Fort River School, if I'm, maybe I'm making this up, but I think this is happening. I think that Fort River School is interested in potentially adding more solar to its uh, property. So if that is the case, then they would need to come to the planning board for site plan review to um, evaluate that proposal, just like um, the Fort River School is allowed by site plan review. So that would be considered an accessory use. Um, now, okay, so an example, probably not Fort River School isn't the best example, but I believe that the Jewish community of Amherst is um, examining the possibility of putting a solar array in their parking lot. And since they are a protected use, they're a religious use, everything that they do there is by site plan review with the planning board. So therefore, when they want to put a solar array on their parking lot, I believe it's going to be a site plan review with the planning board. It hasn't come to us yet as an application, but it's being talked about. Right. Yeah, I have no problem with the uh, accessory uses, but it, what I'm saying is that all why what we need are building permits or site plan reviews. Um, so I'm not disagreeing with you, 
I'm just, it's not clear to me that it has to be, that it may be important to put in that those uses are by right with site plan review or plan, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then just uh, on the general topic of, of is this a standalone, I think one of our earlier conversations is yes, this rather than dispersing all of the items or many of the items amongst other um, um, other sections that if a developer is looking for information about developing large scale projects, they would come to this bylaw, they would have this an intact standalone my recollection. Mandy, and then let's move on. Uh, my recollection is that we didn't decide that yet, and I don't agree with that. Um, so I wouldn't make that a statement that the committee's made that decision. It's one of the things I asked about, had we, and I don't think we have, uh, particularly with definitions. You know, um, if it's considered standalone and things say it's standalone, and there's a use table that says LGPI, but it that definition is not in Article 12, it's only in Article 17. Could someone consider it different in a different manner? Like, like those are questions we need to talk about and why maybe it shouldn't be fully standalone or what are the implications of a fully standalone that says these definitions only apply to this article when you've got a use table that refers to or uses that same term that in theory, that term is not defined in the whole bylaw, it's only defined in a in an article that says that definition only applies to that article. Um, yep. Yeah, th that's why I'm asking the questions. I'm not sure we've made those decisions. Okay, Jennifer, and then we wanna move back to- I, I guess this is just my own question. So like fencing as an example, fencing's, in a, in the zoning bylaw, but it would seem that you would want a particular um, definition or requirements for fencing for a solar installation, a large scale ground mounted solar installation versus, I don't know, a house or. I think we I think we did refer to section seven, you know, when it says when we talk about the fencing. When we get there, we can double check that. No, but so I. So we can have, so I guess what I'm saying is if it's not a standalone, if it is or isn't a standalone bylaw, we can still have our own definitions. If it's not a standalone bylaw, I guess that's the question. We can have our own definitions that aren't, that are different than what's in the use table if it's part of that, the zoning, general zoning bylaw. I'm looking at Chris. I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, and so if it's a standalone bylaw, if we go, if that's what we decide, then we have, it has its own definitions just for LG, LGPIs. If it's not a standalone, then does it like, for example, just like fencing, would it have to follow what's in the, zoning bylaw for other uses? You could have um, sentences within the fence section of the zoning bylaw that would deal with fences for solar um, arrays. Yes, that okay. could be possible. And I think it, someone needs to make that decision as to whether that's a good, a good idea or not. We did not do that. Stephanie and I did not move the fencing to section six um, as part of our work, but as part of work going forward, someone could do that. And someone could also take all the definitions out and put them in uh, article 12, which is the definitions article. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Let's, let's get back to, um, to where we left off, which was around 17.04 or five. I would like to uh, at least let Pat explain what she tried to do and so that we have a context for reviewing it for next time. Where are we in, um... oh, we're in submittal requirements, okay. So we've gotten pretty far in submittal requirements. And number 25, um, 
requirements regarding soils management and conservation on farmland. Um, there was a comment that we had had that in the design section or some other section, and there was a comment that that should really be in the submittal section. So we moved it here. So number 25 was moved here. And those things relate to what we want to see on a plan when a plan is submitted. Um, we want to have baseline soil health, soil health analysis submitted. We want to have a plan showing um, what the uh, basis of the solar arrays would be, um, what the foundations would be, et cetera. So that all makes sense to put it in submittals. Um, what's the next section, Stephanie, that we have? Amanda, you have your hand up. Yeah, in going over the submittals, I had a question about typical submittal requirements. Um, I saw a lot of submittal requirements that are really just um, items that the town is, is easily accessible to the town or to the board. Um, 24 is one of them, the the map, right? Um, or or I think another one was, yeah, 24, the map and description of soil types as listed on this, this online map. Um, one of them was um, number 13, zoning district designation for parcels of land. Um, things that the town kind of controls or the state controls, it's not something that the applicant is applying. And I guess, I, I don't know other submittal requirements. What's the standard for what the town is expected to sort of produce or supply to a board? Um, and what the applicant is. As I review these, what sort of standard should I be thinking of is reasonable for an applicant to provide and request from an applicant versus reasonable to think the town knows, like the zoning district, um, kind of obvious when you look at the zoning map, um, that maybe doesn't need to be in a submittal requirement. Can, can you talk about that for other projects? I'm not talking about, you know, like for other projects. Do you want me to answer that? Yes, please do. So, um, yes, we ask the applicant to supply that information for every application. What we do when we receive an application is check to make sure that all of the information that's submitted is correct. But we don't want to put it upon ourselves to have to find all of this information. We're already, you know, kind of stretched thin. Um, just dealing with applications as they come in. So the more information that applicants can give us um, as part of the submittal is um, needed and welcome. And I, and I would respond that it gives a sense of context of where is this project in the relative world of, of our zoning districts. Okay, we're 24, 25. So um, 20, 32, uh, the visual yes. assessment. Just, just, hold on just a second. So there were a couple of questions that, that remain that were posed by CRC 26 having to do with um, wetland regulations. And so we, in fact, do have this out to the wetland administrator for, uh, for feedback. So um, there was a whole section, I think it was in the design section, uh, that we asked for a visual impact assessment. And it was... Um, discussed with the CRC and determined that that was really more of a submittal. Whether you want it or not, it's really a submittal rather than something that is in a design standard. So we we took it out of where it was and we put it into submittal. So as part of the application, uh, the applicant would be required to submit this information. Okay. Thank you. Um, the same with design requirements for agrivoltaics on farmland. Rather than having that in the design section, we said, well, if someone wants to um, propose agrivoltaics on farmland, it's really um, going to be part of the submittal, the application submittal. 
that he uh, tell, tell us what he's going to do with the farmland. So submit a plan, um, submit a detailed design, et cetera. Fencing. Um, so we can have this discussion about whether fencing should be here or in the fencing section. Um, and it certainly could be in the fencing section and it would just be specific to solar arrays. But um, I guess we made, we made a sentence that said, in the case of conflict, Article 17 shall override the requirements of Article 6. Alternatively, we can just pluck this section out and put it in Article 6 and have it refer to um, so large-scale ground-mounted so solar arrays. So what would you like us to do? I don't think we need to decide that tonight. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, under slope and soils, we added a reference to section 1704 submittal requirements because um, we did ask to have that information submitted as part of the application. Vertical clearance. Um, is there anything else that we need? Oh yeah, avian power line interaction committee. That was something that was um, sent to us by or given to us by a, a person who was involved in a lot of review of solar, large scale solar arrays out in California. And that was a very important aspect of the reviews out there. Um, so we put it in at his suggestion. Um, I'm not really, familiar with the avian power line interaction committee and so that um, it would be up to you as to whether you want to leave that in or not we can identify if it has if it has a similar value in the east where there's a lot more interference with trees and other things yeah. than in california right uh, vertical clearance um this was uh, information that was given to us by, I think it was the water pollution control, or no, water. Water supply protection. Water supply <laughs> committee. Yeah. 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 Um, and they, they said that um, the elevation should be 10 feet or less. It has to do with scouring of the land below the arrays. Heights greater than 10 feet shall be approved by the PGA. Now, a height greater than 10 feet would be required in a parking lot, but you wouldn't have scouring below um, the arrays in a parking lot. So that's something that should be uh, further investigated. How do we deal with these things in a parking lot versus here? Well, I guess in a parking lot, it would be an accessory use. So it would be under a different section, a, di a different um, permitting regime. And so this really refers only to uh, principal uses. So I guess I'm, I'm thinking as I'm talking. Um, Water Supply Protect Protection Committee requirements, they had a number of things that they wanted us to include. Um, and this is the entire list. I think there are at least one or two things that are repetitive. So down below you can see heights greater than 10 feet shall be approved by the permit granting authority that already uh, appears up above elevation of solar array panel is greater than 10 feet, BMPs will be necessary. So again, that's kind of repetitive. But as Stephanie said, we didn't um, do a lot of editing here. We just took things, um, you know, the full section and moved them to the, the, to the appropriate location. And uh, s editing is going to have to occur now. Not, not tonight, but <laughs> at some point. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Councilor Haneke. Um, a question to be answered next time with vertical clearance. Um, are agrivoltaics, when in use, installed higher than 10 feet? They probably are in order to allow equipment to go underneath them. Okay, so, so could you ask staff potentially to think about the interaction of this vertical clearance section with the desire as, um, or preference for agrivoltaics on stuff and how those two in a review situation work together. 
um, or whether this makes it harder to get approval for an agrivoltaic. I, I don't know whether there's things, but but thinking about all of there's a whole section on agrivoltaics, and then you've got this section that says you got to be lower than ten feet unless the PGA approves it. Is that in some sense? Um, resulting in potentially encouraging non-agrivoltaics over agrivoltaics applications because it's an extra it's an extra sort of exception to the rule that might not be granted. Do you know? I, I I don't know whether I'm asking this clearly. Like, is that something we could get some staff guidance on when staff comments come back or be pointed out to staff of how do those interact with each other and would it maybe hamper or or result in certain applications being changed because of this need of approve you know sort of exception to an extra exception and and waiver or whatever yeah that's a good question i think um heights greater than 10 feet shall be approved by the pga is that would just be part of the review process it doesn't say you need a special permit or a any kind of waiver in order to um, have that be approved, but it's probably a good question to uh, investigate. Maybe we could just word this differently. Well, it would be, is there a conflict between outlining it like this and any of the photovoltaic considerations or, or requirements? Agrivoltaic. Agrivol, what did I say? Photovoltaic, yeah. agrivoltaic. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, moving along, page 11. Ecosystem protection. Um, we deleted that uh, long description of um, ecosystem services. Here, this relates to uh, clearing and Stephanie and I had this discussion when we were editing or not editing but doing what you asked us to do with this section um, whether we should restrict forest clearing in core habitat and natural landscapes critical critical natural landscapes and biomap um, Stephanie said these things are already regulated by state regulations and that we really don't need to address them here and that's something that I don't really know a lot about, but um, it's something that we can check with the uh, wetlands administrator about. She would know more, or Dave Zomek, in fact, would know more. So, um, and it's, of course, Stephanie used to be the wetlands administrator, so she knows more than I do. So the question was, is this um, too limiting? And, um, and I don't know the answer to that. And can can as we read this, just so I'm aware too, is it it's talking about um, no clearing on biomap three level quality forest. Yes, core habitat, critical natural landscapes that are shown on biomap three, and on land de designated as priority habitat or estimated habitat, and there may be ways that you can do clearing in those places um, that is not as, you know, disturbing. Um, and so it's a, it's an area that I don't know a lot about. And so someone else would have to advise us about that. And we have a note to that effect. Okay. Um, and as we said, we deleted the section on ecosystem services 17.07. Um, Can I just make a comment in the in the future as we go through as we as we get staff comments, for instance, on section 1707, and then we go and delete it, it becomes really hard to track. So maybe if we have a section and we decide to delete it, we'll just cross it out and leave leave it there with it crossed out. So at least we hold the places of the rest of the text. Just to let you know, this is the version that we sent to staff members. Okay. 
didn't even see the ecosystem services in there. But I agree with your approach in the future. Um, dimensional standards, that was something someone asked us to put in a table, and I just haven't gotten around to doing that yet. Um, battery energy storage systems, I don't think we had any changes that we made to that. Um, and that we're leaving it in here because we don't have a battery energy storage bylaw. Uh, protection of drinking water supplies. Um, now, these things were given to us by the Watership Protection Committee. Um, and some of them may be referred to elsewhere. So we'll have to go and see, you know, how do these relate to other parts of the bylaw? and make sure that we're not being repetitive. But we haven't done that yet. Chris, I will say that we did make the note about um, review by DPW, that DPW should That's look right. at the yes, exactly. And we did, we did send it to DPW as part of the staff review. Mm -hmm. We sent it to uh, Guilford and Jason and Amy Rizeki, right? Excellent. Uh, uh, so Facebook, some, some of the same things, uh, the drinking water protection uh, may be similar to what was on page 10 just about above. Right. Uh, Mandy, Mandy, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, as I was reviewing this again, I noticed the first sentence of this section 1710 says, with regard to protection of drinking water resources, the following construction and post construction stormwater management requirements shall be met. And the question that came up to me was the section before that's told, called stormwater management and erosion and sedimentation control and says you got to abide by general bylaw 3.57. And so then I got thinking, how does section 1710 comport and, and confer with section 1709 if section 1710 is also basically referring to stormwater management requirements? Um, because that's what 1709 is. And does anything in section 1710 actually conflict with general bylaw 3.57? And I haven't looked that up, but it's as I read read that introductory sentence that before that list, I said, well, this is all stormwater management. I think that's why we said DPW should be taking a look at this. Okay. So I, by the way, I just want to note that I don't have my raise hand feature, so I'm sorry that I'm just jumping in. <laughs> That's I can't fine. Remember. That's fine. And if you want to just wave it and make a motion, maybe you'll okay. we'll see it. <laughs> okay. You're you're at the edge of my screen. Okay, and, and reporting requirements. Um, we had talked about putting all of our reporting requirements together. Um, so this section includes reco reporting requirements during construction, after construction, and then um, submitting an annual report. And there's also reporting requirements for agrivoltaics on farmland, which I think we had moved from another section that talked about agrivoltaics on farmland. There are probably other things in the bylaw related to reporting that may need to be moved to this section, but we didn't, um, didn't do that. I mean, we haven't done that yet. And then I think the next section that we changed was financial surety. We didn't really change it, did we? We just highlighted things. Um, so this type of surety is a typical thing that happens. The building commissioner often requires a, uh, a bond of some sort in order to accomplish things. If someone wants a temporary certificate of occupancy, but they haven't put their landscaping in yet, he'll require a bond or some type of surety or a bank check or something like that to make sure that if it comes about that the project is finished and the contractor goes away and doesn't do what he said he was going to do, he he will be, um, we, we will be able to do it ourselves given the, the amount of money that we have. So it's kind of a surety for the town and that's how this is supposed to work. And this section I think should be reviewed by the building commissioner because he's used to dealing with this all the time. Um, so we have a note to that effect. Mm -hmm. 
and then appeals. I think there was a question about um, things being not in the right order here. So um, currently someone aggrieved by a decision of the planning board or the building commissioner can appeal to the zoning board of appeals under, um, under chapter 40A. And then an appeal from a decision of the building commissioner must be filed within 30 days. So that follows from the first sentence. And then the second two sentences, we didn't um, change anything about those. Those are stand standard. So does anyone have any questions? I'm sure you have a lot of questions. I shouldn't. Yeah, <laughs> plenty of it. Um, it, But we did um, what we were asked to do. And now we've presented this to you and we presented it to a list of um, staff people. Excellent. And they could give you that list if you were interested. So. Thank you. And that, that is exactly what we had requested uh, happen. And we'll see a compiled list of comments back. I'm guessing on section by section, um, comments from various people. Um, Man, do you have your hand up? Yeah, one question on section 1717 that's on the screen and then a question on sort of process next. Um, taxes on payment in lieu of, I don't know what it's called, taxes or payment in lieu of taxes. Um, I guess my question is, is this something that the zoning bylaw has done in the past um, and is it legal? <laughs> um to to condition a use a building you know a use permit on payment of taxes that you don't actually that you're exempt from on a state level um for next week and all i i don't know whether you'd have an answer now um if you do great um but it just sort of struck me as huh is this something we can actually do as part of a land use requirement um and then for for the chair my question on process is you know i i went through one of these um marked up a document um i apparently marked up the wrong one but at what point are we going to be discussing and when will we get the document that i should be marking up with track changes for my comments i don't want to have to continually move Right. my comments document to document to document. So right. so when when is that process? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we will have we will have simply comments back at at this point, the document that we read tonight is the document that all the staff have worked on. It is not it is not exactly, I think, the same document that Pat worked on, but she can tell us that in a minute. Um, but I would use this version four as the as the primary at this point. And it does say V4 draft at the top with the 9424 date. And I'd like that to go in the header so that it doesn't just get so get get lost. And then each of us can add our own names to our version of that. Um I want to reconnoiter. It is it is 804. Pat has been waiting patiently to explain to us what um what she has attempt you get your yeah. your mute. Yeah, I, have, I have one question. Chris, I I think you said I'm having trouble with my audio. So but I think you said that you could give us a list of the town staff it has gone to. I'm not going to ask you to do that right this second unless it's super easy. But if you would send that to me or to us, that would be great. I, I could actually, I sent it oh, out great. so I can, um, well, you can just continue and at some point I can raise my hand if you don't mind going backwards. You can go forward in your conversation. I'll find it and then I'll raise my hand. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. No, is, is that a... Okay, so um, so we have a couple things. We, we have, um, I think we have a set of meeting, meeting minutes to review, but I only found them this afternoon in our folder. So I'm not even sure they were part of our packet. Um, did anyone else find them? They were from April 4. You did see them? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, not till late in the afternoon. So yeah. other members might probably didn't have a chance to read them. Okay. 
I'm I'm not going to press it if if we didn't. We'll pass I it along to next them. week. Okay, so we're not going to deal with meeting minutes. Um, Pat, would you like to explain to us the process you took and and sort of generally the approach you took? Again, I don't really want to go into the details, but if people have specific questions of you and your approach, you should be more than welcome to explain. And do we have any, do you want to use a document or just tell us what you've done? I can, I have uh, a document that is in the packet that is uh, proposed changes and it's uh, got things in yellow, which does seem to be helpful. So if you could pull that up, that would be great. Is that your clean version or your draft changes version? I think that's the clean version. Let me, I'm getting confused too. So um, draft changes have, yeah, is yellow. not clean. Draft changes has what I've taken out or where I've moved, take, move something. Okay. Uh, so if we're just going to- That's gonna in do, red. Yes. But if we're going to just look, uh, just have me go through it briefly, then we can use the clean copy, which is in yellow. Okay, let's see. That makes sense to you. Yeah. Okay, let me. Yeah, let me. Can I everybody see that? Yeah. Basically, working. Go ahead, Stephanie. I'm sorry. Stephanie, do you, are you pulling it up? Sorry, just trying my audio. No, I had the list of um, staff members. Okay, do you want to just e job. email it to me and I'll send it out to everybody? Sure. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, thank you. Pat, can you see the screen? Yes, I can. Okay. I mean, my goal was to take uh, the version um, that was presented um, and really it, I went back into August but to really look at it and to take into consideration some of the comments I heard and to try to make the document in some ways simpler and cleaner um, so there are some minor things and some more major things I um, so we can go yeah uh, the nexus statement, uh, which we I think that we should still have because it's not clear what the state is going to do, and we may still have to defend a solar bylaw with the state given different uh, legal challenges to earlier things. So, but I did try to simplify it, um, and I also you'll see the section on farmland is cut down quite a bit because. We go on later to talk about forested lands and um, farmland, and it has been moved there. Um, I'm sorry, I'm scrolling quickly looking for farmland. Yeah, it's uh, it's on it's 1706 here it in this here document. Is, yeah, here, here it is. So uh, some of the nexus statements that are in the opening of the bylaw, as we have it. Um, have been moved here, uh, and there's an and there's some addition there. Um, if you could, um, okay, can you can you pull go back? Okay, so that has done. Um, and then on definitions, uh huh, seventeen oh three. I we kept. I I felt like it was important to keep the ecosystem service but it's cut down dramatically from what was in the bylaw. So that's a change. And also the same thing um, is true with the farmland, the prime farm. Yeah, we're not. One minute. So, excuse me, Pat. So you have the ecosystem service definition, which may uh, mean that you also want to keep the ecosystem service section. Yes, I do. In the text. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then as you go down to prime farmland, that we're that we we've shortened that, I think. Um let me see. And then uh da -da -da. then we go. It's kind of tricky. All right, if you go down, uh, just keep going down the document. There are a couple of GOL things that 
not going to worry about here. Um, and so design screen and you go below. <laughs> how far do I go, Pat? Well, I'm trying to, it's very hard for me to see what you're doing. Let me see. Um, can you give me a section number? Yeah, I'm getting there. Okay. Screening and uh, planting in section 1705 design standards. Right. Yep. Um, we have reduced that down and, uh, and tried to streamline it um, and make it very specific. Um, and then as you go down, yeah, the, this should be, we're feeling that these uh, two th items should still be kept. And then if you go down into visual impact, it'll be much easier when we're actually really doing this. But, um, and, and I want to thank Mandy Joe for pushing me on this one, um, because she really felt like, Hey, I don't. I'm, I'm. I'm going to paraphrase you probably badly. I don't want to stand on Mount Sugarloaf and be able to see a solar um, installation, and therefore it's you know it shouldn't be built there. So it, the project. So that's really been skimmed down, and this is what I've tried to do. And is the project shall avoid visual impacts to the greatest extent feasible. All right, and the applicant shall confer with the town of Amherst staff to identify points of view or particular interest or concern. Um, and that feels uh, important to me. Um, and if you go down, you can see into 1706, you can see that farmland has uh, more of a statement about access to uh, 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 locally grown food and what productive farmland is and the key principles of the Commonwealth's Resilient Lands Initiative, which are no net loss of farms and forests and expand the amount and quality and accessibility of locally grown foods. Um, so if you keep going down, I'll talk about this in detail. Um, there's, we saved almost all of, we, we didn't really take out very much. So here on forested land, um, see my notes. We rearrange the wording here somewhat, okay? And um, far, uh, let me see. Okay. You know, here we tried to increase the buffer. The forest soils are also an important element for minimizing disturbance. Therefore, minimizing disturbance of forest soils will help preserve carbon sequestration. So that becomes that is the ecosystem protection section that we feel strongly should be there. Okay, and then there's the maximization. And then where there were design standards in 1708, none of the standards had anything to do except with setbacks. So I pulled those together and uh, put them in one place so that all the setbacks for the installations are there. Uh, we do reference best and battery storage in the setbacks. Um, and we have added somewhat to the battery storage requirements that are already in this bylaw. Uh, Mandy, you have your hand up. Uh, oh, yep. Thank you, Mandy. No, keep going. My hand's for when you're done. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. Um, where am I? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, we, oh, and in this section, we, I would like to remove all of these, um, um, websites, oh, cross things like that. Yeah, yeah. that's, I didn't yeah. do that, but that's not really necessary. Uh, yeah. and if we and go then, to, now we added, I uh, added, uh, section 1712 on hazardous waste. Good. Yeah. And that's a whole new section that has not been uh, in the bylaw at all. Um, and I think it's incredibly important. I think it. Uh, I took this from a Cape Cod um, bylaw, and it 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 is a critical addition, I think. Um, and then let me see. 
Then if you go down to transfer of ownership, okay. This, the thing that we're adding, there should be no time lapse in providing an emergency contact. And I think this is critical for the maintenance of the systems. Um, and I'm doing a really bad job of doing this, but the, no, this is fine. We're just trying to keep it fairly general. Okay, so that's, and, and you can see where there are sections where we've kept um, the, uh, the work of staff in terms of um, design standards and things like that. We did, um, I think we I talked about that. All right. I think that's kind of vaguely general. Now I'm ready to be hatcheted. <laughs> <laughs> Hatcheting and hatching is next week. Yeah, no, Mandy knows I'm teasing her, I hope. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to close this down, right? I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah, that's um, unless Mandy needs it. Yeah, go ahead. Mandy, Mandy, go ahead. Or Dave. Thank you. I, I wanted to to correct Pat on on her paraphrasing of my visual impact. <laughs> um, in some sense, she's right, though. Um, no, I just wanted to say I'm actually going to fight the visual impact section um, because I think what I said to Pat was, what if someone, not me, but yeah. someone <laughs> says, and I don't want to, you know, that they say they don't want to see it, so it can't happen. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm going to push back on that when we get to that about what is health safety and welfare. And frankly, my welfare is improved by looking at a large scale solar project. I'm just going to say that. And so oh, are many I'm other young people too. because they see us doing something. And so what is visual impact? But that that's for next week. Um, when I was reviewing it and everything, and when we were talking today, and I, I wanted to bring up this question because it kind of relates to the best system. There's a section in the bylaw of best, but there's a lot of things that refer to LGBT, uh, L, L, G, P, I, um, um, you know, that'll say th these large scale ground mount solars have to have setbacks of X, Y, Z. The large scale ground mount solars have to protect for hazardous waste. The large scale ground mount solars. And, and as I was reading that, the large scale ground mount solars need a financial short surety. The large scale ground mount solars, I, I think you're getting my point. And as I was reading that, I said, well, couldn't we just add Bess in there to make you know, like instead of right now, there's like a section 1706 that's that's Bess and only Bess, and Bess is not mentioned really anywhere else in this bylaw. Um, couldn't we think about as we review this, what sections, what what setbacks, what um, design standards, what financial sureties, what owner transfer of ownership sections should apply to Bess, and and maybe. That is, I'm not saying it's a complete solution, but as we talk about this, and I'm mentioning it now for maybe we can get some staff comments on some of that um, <laughs> as I add more things to the staff. Sorry, Chris. Um, um, Chris and Stephanie on that. But but maybe the staff can think about potentially as an interim solution, if we're going to continue working on the solar bylaw, are there places where it's not just section 1706 that talks about best. Maybe you don't even need that, whatever section it is that's solely best. Maybe you can incorporate best in some sense, potentially temporarily into all of these different sections by saying LGPI and best um, for them that might help us engage in that regulation in an appropriate manner. Um, because we might not have the capacity to do a separate bylaw. And oh, that's as a CRC, placeholder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yes, it, placeholder yeah. and stuff like that. Right, good. David. Um, two quick comments. One, um, visual impacts is very interesting. Mandy kind of spurred me to think of, I was thinking of the uh, solar arrays that are off of East Hadley Road. And I'll be curious to see how the group with staff input kind of works through visual impacts. but. I remember when that solar array first went in, I was I was uh, taken aback. I was, wow, look at that, all in the middle of all this farmland. But then I learned more about the array and I realized that they actually put it on the least productive farmland in that larger area. And now when I drive by it, I go, wow, um, that's producing green energy. So 
visual impacts can mean, you know, different things to everybody. So anyway, but my main comment was about process. And I know it is 820 and yeah. I'm sure maybe I'm <laughs> we're cognizant of that. But um, I just want to make sure we may not have time today, but I am most concerned with your process and how, what are the expectations for staff? I'm kind of comparing this to the way CRC moved through the new rental registration bylaw. And back many months ago when, when we moved through that, as I recall, Mandy was the keeper of, as chair, was the keeper of the edits. So I'm, mm -hmm. so we're gonna have staff comments. We're, we're gonna have the document that Chris and, and Christine have worked on, uh, to Chris and Stephanie have worked on. And now we have Pat's comments or, or version. I, you know, it's not dramatically new, but I just wanna, I, I'm just asking, uh, the chair to think carefully about that between now and two weeks from now, how are we going to manage these edits? Because I think that's going to have an impact on all of you and your efficiency, but also on staff. How do we manage Thank those you. edits? Thank so you. I'll yeah. put that out to you. Thank yeah. you. Can I yeah. just respond to, to the edit question? There is a version in the packet where I work through the edits. It's not a clean copy, so you can see the document as it was presented. Um, and then I, those changes, and perhaps I should have gone through with that so you could see, because like design standards weren't changed. There was a whole lot that wasn't changed, um, or but it might have been moved, and I was not that clear about that. And I'm if one I more just end by saying I'm going to work with Stephanie and Christine on how we compile the staff comments because I think they're those right. could send us in all different directions as well, and I think we need to be really yeah. efficient on that. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Jennifer, and then I'll try to comment. Yeah, I guess so. We will have a conversation because when you um, talk about minimizing more of the visual impacts, I really um, like the screening and planting section. So Pat, I was going to say, I, I, act, I thought what you did, I agreed with most. I thought it streamlined it. I agreed with a lot of your edits, except I do like the staff screening and planting. I think that's... I think that's very important that that be in the document um, and that we, we have those standards, but that's getting more into the weeds. Um, yeah, I've been thinking of how, because when I went through it, I was really taking notes, you know, comparing Pat's um, version to staff and at what point will we kind of merge, is there a way to merge them so we can go through it in one document? After, it's probably not the next meeting because we still have more staff comments, maybe after that. So, so I just put I, that out there. I, how will you know, so this is marrying these two? So yeah. we need all the change, you know, proposed changes in one place. Well, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say that we also have comments from Pam Rooney or from Councillor Haneke that that are gonna come in and essentially the same way that that Pat has um you know, given her thoughts in, in some sort of form. So um, we have all the staff commentary, not edits, but commentary coming in. And I think it's a really, really good starting point. We will have, um, I'm expecting to see from folks next, next time that they may have their own version of something that they've thought through. And I think the important thing is, is thinking through the different sections and how you understand and interpret them and what you think is important to keep or not keep. Um, that's kind of the discussion. At the point after after input is gathered and we may get letters from people, we I already have you know a pile of stuff from people in the community that have written about certain topics. Um, I am going to volunteer and and probably to work with Stephanie to go through some of that editing and we will try to compile or I, I could try to compile everyone's comments section by section um, so that we have a humongous rough draft and then and then take be able to to compare all these notes in one place. Does that make sense? And is anyone else volunteering? 
maybe me, but I yeah, I want to make a comment before we're done, but please maybe do. Please me. Do. I have to think about it carefully. Okay. I'd love working with Stephanie and it'd be fine to work with you too. But I have to think about it. Jennifer, you have your hand up. That was just to be my suggestion. If a member of the committee could work with someone on the staff, it's a lot to take on yourself. I think it would be helpful to work with. And we can do that. Okay. Maybe because we can't work, what, two of us on the committee can't work together on it, but one of us could work with staff. Yeah. And I'm, I'm volunteering. Um, do we want to leave it at that? Do we want to make that decision next week? We don't have a meeting next week. Do we? You know what I mean, the next, the 24th. Yeah. Mandy. I would like to hear from Dave Zomack and Paul Bockelman on our volunteering staff for something that was referred to us to come up with a report and recommendation and a draft on. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I appreciate it, but I, I don't think it's within our power to assign work to staff members. Um, so I, I, Dave's here. I'd like to hear his thoughts and, and be able to think about thoughts on how we manage the, the document itself. A lot of the editing happens within a meeting, frankly, um, and it's just keeping track of them because we can't discuss the edits outside of meetings. Um, we have to discuss them and sort of come to agreement within a public meeting and someone needs to, you know, I, I did it by doing them on with rental registration. Y'all saw my screen. I made the changes there and just right. saved various versions and that was it. Um, maybe I, I created a works. clean version after it and renamed it for the next meeting and all to keep very good track of documents because um, tracking them was important. But I'd like to hear from Dave about his thoughts on staff's ability to do stuff and whether he believes it's their role or based on the referral, whether it's our role. Can I clarify what I said? Um, at some point, Stephanie and and Christine were sort of volunteering to do some of this work. So I was sort of taking them up on that. It does not have to go to them. But yes, Dave, your thoughts, please. And then we need to wrap up. Yeah, no, you need, um, real quick, um, there was reference a few minutes ago to different versions and I don't recall who, it's not important. Somebody said staff version. I just wanna make sure there isn't a staff version. There is your version that's Stephanie and Christine tried to yep. incorporate <laughs> it. So it's your version. Pat has a version, if you will, with some new edits and comments, which is fine. Um, to Mandy's question, I do, I do think the way we work through as as long as it took, and it was it was a lot of work to go through the rental bylaw, the the the, the new one. I think that's the way to do it, and I really think section by section. I guess we're talking about staff today. Um, we have two, three staff members on the screen here. I know. In a couple of weeks, it'll be Stephanie taking the lead on this, supporting you. So. I really do think the more the committee can take on, the better. And I like the way the the, the structure and the the practical way we work through um, the rental bylaw. Um, what else was I going to say? Um, oh, and I, I guess what I was also going to say is I think it's going to be quite a bit of work for Stephanie to manage the staff comments. Yeah. And she and I and Chris, while Chris is here, need to talk about how do we do that with the list of people that we're gathering uh, input from and how do we manage their input to you? I think that's gonna fall directly to Stephanie. So I guess I would look to the chair to say, how do you manage what happens in the meeting? Editing yeah. while the meeting is going on is a really efficient way to do it if that can be done. Okay, sounds good. We'll come forward with some strategy outlined and, um, I want to stop that conversation. So we have uh, no approval of minutes. Can I just say one thing? Yes. My, very small and probably I'm wasting everybody's time. Uh, Dave made a very important point about visual impacts. I was at a, a farm uh, uh, in the spring getting some flowers and down the way in the field, there were all these white domes and things. And I looked 
And it was a solar and large scale ground mounted solar. Uh, and there were sheep eating grass and stuff in and around it. And it was a wonderful sight to see. But the person whose flowers I were buying, they hate it. They think it's ugly. I thought it was beautiful. So I seem to have a reputation to be anti-solar and anti-large ground mounted, but I'm not. I just want it done well, and I want to protect what we need to protect so, to really make changes. So enough of my crap. So for the record, Pat's, Pat's on the record. Um, action item number 4C actually was nuisance bylaw. There were several comments uh, last night at town council. If you have some specific responses to, count, to um, comments that were made, email them to me and I am going to compile them so that we can distribute that to folks for better understanding of the nuisance bylaw. Uh, I would appreciate that if you would do that. Um, item six, uh, item five, no meeting approvals. Um, items uh, six, announcements, no announcements. Number seven, next agenda preview. We are going to talk about rules and regulations for com for council committees. That's going to be an agenda topic. Um, we will also have solar bylaw and, and presumably maybe a follow-up on BESS, but for now, those are the two topics. Uh, no, nothing uh, anticipated 48 hours in advance. And before I adjourn, I'm going to uh, look to Councillor Haneke with her hand up. Thank you. I have an announcement. It was made at last night's meeting, but I'd like to make it again since it kind of directly applies to our committee purpose. Um, this Friday and Saturday, there are the downtown design guidelines in person stuff. And I say stuff because there's multiple things. 3.30 to 5, there is the walk. Um, I believe the downtown walk for downtown design guidelines with the consultant. Um, six to eight is the listening session. I think that's at the Bang Center. Um, I think hopefully no, it's, it's at the high school. Me if I'm wrong. high school. I think it's at the high oh, school. Oh, sorry. At the high school. Um, and on Saturday, the 14th from 9 to 1230 <laughs> is the visioning session also at the high school. Um, so in case someone missed those announcements last night at the council meeting. I thought it was appropriate to make those announcements at today's meeting. Thank you. I'm going to make a motion to adjourn, and then we all will go to the debates. Uh, let's go around the room. Second. Pat, Pat DeAngelis. I just seconded the motion to you adjourn, Thank but you. I vote aye. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer. Yes. Uh, Fred, uh, excuse me. Councillor Ette. Aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Pam Rooney, aye. Thank you, David, Christina, Christine, and Stephanie, very, very much. We appreciate your patience. Have a good evening. Bye, everybody.